Welcome, uh, David Rhodes, uh, and he's going to provide us with an update on TA21. Go ahead, David. All right. All right, uh, I am the supervisor for the environmental remediation work for the Los Alamos field office. Uh, demolition uh, activities also fall under my scope, so probably the right person to talk to you about that subject. The map that you see up on the presentation, that front page, is the old maps that we had when the buildings were still standing. Uh, they existed from as early as the 70s up until the American Resource uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the ARA projects came along and did a substantial amount of demolition at TA-21. After the ARA projects completed back in 2011, there have been some activities going on at Technical Area 21, but with the change in uh, Los Alamos priorities to reflect the framework agreement with 3706 and then the groundwater, the cleanup at TA-21 has taken like a third, fourth, or fifth priority in the order. So there's been relatively little activity other than cleaning up some bits and pieces in the, in the last couple of years. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was just what the TA-21 mission was briefly, the consent order investigations that are required out at the area. I'll briefly touch on the R projects. And then the remaining activities that we still have to go and then I'll give you a brief description of what our plans going forward are, which at this point still have not been set uh, because we have not put a plan together to talk with the environment department in terms of does this match their priorities. So please keep that in mind. Uh, taking a look at the map, this shows the details on what was there in relation to the pre-existing facilities. You can see in this area is the old DP East, Delta Prime East facilities, and this is what we call the DP West. There are several material disposal areas, MDAU, which was previously investigated and cleaned up. MDAA is a material disposal area with two trenches, similar but smaller to what we saw at MDA Bravo. It has a central debris pit, and it has two plutonium solution tanks called the General's Tanks and they're all below grade. There's nothing exposed except for some temporary access ports we used to sample the tanks a couple of years ago. MDAT, which was a shaft disposal area and some absorption beds where they disposed of uh, radioactive liquid. That will be uh, in completion of the investigation and a remedy proposed. Uh, right now, the DP West, excuse me, let me back up, the DP East, the facilities and slabs were all removed under ARA. The buried piping from DP East all the way over to this MDAT facility, there was the Rad Liquid Waste Treatment Facility, Building 21-257 at that location. All that buried piping that went down that portion of the mesa has been excavated and removed. The DP West, the buildings were removed. The slabs were left in place. We needed the funding in order to finish MDA Bravo, so we suspended that, leaving the slabs in place. The buried piping from DP West, also over to MDAT and those process facilities, are still buried, so we still have work to do. Up at the upper corner, upper left corner, you see MDAV. That was a site of some discharge beds. We had done some previous vitrification projects. Uh, where we tried to glassify the buried waste and were s marginally, moderately successful, not marginally, moderately successful on that to the point where we were able to get a certificate of completion, or excuse me, at that time it was no further action uh, from the environment department. So that one is clean for our purposes. And MDA Bravo, which we went through the ARA projects to excavate all of the waste material, uh, I will get into a little bit later. These MDAB and MDAV are in such close proximity that we are talking about transferring that entire parcel containing both of those MDAs to Los Alamos County, and I'll touch on that later too. DP West, the mission for that has always been plutonium processing. Uh, these were the facilities that were put in place after we moved out of the Los Alamos town site those facilities that were surrounding Ashley Pond uh, in those areas. The DP East, and what I have referred to as TSTA, it was the Tritium Systems Test Assembly Facility. We're dealing with polonium and tritium processing. 
Those facilities came in a bit later, um, had a very different mission than the plutonium, but they also supported the weapons program. The five disposal areas we talked about, three of which were primarily radiological disposal, uh, and MDAs A and T were radiological materials. There was liquid and there was grout. So there were some things in there. The liquid and grout was primarily MDAT, but of course the liquid disposal was also the general's tanks at MDAA. There is a segment of facilities that exist called balance of plant. These were the support facilities, things like radiological material warehouse. We had a sanitary waste treatment facility. Uh, there were a couple of other structures that we had used for interim material storage uh, and some regular support facilities. Several of those facilities have already been torn down to slabs. We're going to pull the slabs up with the rest of it. But the warehouse, the sanitary waste treatment facility currently exists, so we'll be working on those. Uh, also part of the balance of plant were the potable water sources at the Mesa, which were the two water towers that are visible, and I'll talk about that in a moment too. Consent order investigations. Out at TA-21, we have roughly 200 solid waste management units. These were historical places where we had had known releases, where we had had uh, legacy materials that either had been disposed of, like the MDAs. Um, and we have done investigations, two phases of which, uh, which we called the Delta Prime Sites Aggregate Area Investigations. We have actually done a third phase of the investigation, but we had to reprioritize activities and we did not finish the report. So there will be another report out that further characterized some of the areas we didn't finish early on. Out at TA-21, there are about 24 outfalls. They have all been either removed or closed, which means sealed up. They've been plugged with concrete actually in the pipe. Uh, and anything that was associated with that outfall has been removed. That was going along the lines of the laboratories trying to go to a zero discharge type thing, so all of the outfalls were early prioritized work. Get them off the canyon rim so that they didn't exist. The material disposal areas, MDAV was investigated, and there were two in situ vitrification technology pilots. Just to give you a characterization in case you're not familiar with the vitrification, they sunk some anodes, uh, some metal conduit into the surface materials, ran electric charge through it, and actually heated the subsurface soils and the contaminated material, turning it into glass. It's a pretty good size monolith that now exists in that area, and we have since characterized around the glass, that was in the earlier investigations, uh, so that we don't have any further cleanup to go and do at, those site, at that site. MDAU was investigated, and it was less than necessary in order to get a no further action, so it met the uh, screening levels that we have from the state. MDAB, of course, was excavated between 2009 and 2011. Of course, you've been well briefed, I assume, on the MDA Bravo trials and tribulations. The MDAA, the general's tanks and its trenches and the central pit, have gone through a first phase of the investigation. We had gone back in, back in 2010, to actually sample the remaining water, and there wasn't much, and the sludge heel that was in the bottom of the tanks. That sludge heel is going to be part of the difficulty in either removing the tanks or trying to bury them in place if we end up capping the landfill. Right now, the default plan is those tanks, the sludge will be removed, and the tanks will be removed, and clean soil, clean fill will be placed back in that location. Those tanks do not have any indication of having leaked. I uh, believe they are carbon steel tanks. Uh, they were actually a thicker wall than what a standard buried tank might have been at the age because of the plutonium solutions. But at the time they were installed, the plutonium was such a valuable asset and it was so prohibitively expensive, they collected all process water that had plutonium in it. They wanted to let it get filtered out so that they can recover even the minor elemental pieces of it. It was just that valuable. Those tanks were the primary place for all of the TA-21 operations to get, let that water collect. Okay, just to run through real quick, you can see what ARA projects had done. 
These were the mobile enclosures and the fixed enclosures that they used to excavate MDAB. On the right-hand side, you see what looks like a railroad train. That is actually the storage area for the waste bins that we had collected with the excavated material prior to them being shipped for disposal. Uh, but you can see two segments of the fixed enclosures going down and then around the corner to the right. The ARA TSTA and the Delta Prime East demolition, there is a little inset in your picture that shows it uh, closer up than the aerial view I provided earlier. And then the final, the vehicles and bins that you see, once we demolished the area and cleaned it up, we actually used it for bin storage and for laydown equipment for doing the DP West area and the remaining work under ARA. Uh, right now, all of those structures are gone, so it looks like a pretty darn clean site. It looks like a gravel parking lot. Here is the DP West area. Um, in the inset, again, is the buildings that were there. They were several multi-winged buildings. And as you can tell from the picture going towards the water tower, you can see where the concrete slabs still remain in the above surface. Most of the ancillary pieces like the vehicles and uh, the bins and there's other equipment scattered around, that has also been removed. It looks like a pretty clean surface, just like a concrete cover. The remaining demolition, I tried to provide a couple of pictures. We have two water towers, the west and the east. We are planning, it says June, but this was based on the earlier date for your presentation, so I apologize. The date on those demolitions is expected to be August 11th and 12th. Uh, we have issued a federal contract to a contractor to come in and go do that. Uh, DOE is managing that contract ourselves instead of having lands do it. And uh, we have received the demolition plans. It's currently in review and the contractor should be doing some site mobilization this coming week, and they should be ready after a short time to pull the towers down. The remainder of the balance of plant includes a warehouse, which is the picture in the middle left. There's a sanitary waste treatment facility. It's a relatively small set of structures. That's the one with the yellow railings in it. That's a picture of the inside. Uh, there were a couple of interior sumps and a couple of exterior Absorption beds, after the water had been treated and processed, the sanitary water went out to be evaporated or infiltrated. There is the radiological liquid waste facility, which, depending on how we go and talk with the state, may or may not be accelerated in 2016. The building at the bottom is the building itself. It's a primarily concrete structure. There is a uh, roof to it. There are interior sumps. It was primarily the treatment facility where it ran through tanks. The tanks are still there. We do have internal contamination in that facility. And as a matter of fact, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be going back in to take further characterization samples so that we can fix our work plans. Uh, that building has been cold and dark for a while. We have not made entry into the building until about two months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for our first entry to go and take contamination surveys inside the building. We knew it was possibly, uh, we knew it would be contaminated, we just don't know how high a level it is. So we went in with the full PPE controls, personal protective equipment. And then the DP West slabs, I showed you the aerial views and I don't think we need to have another picture. The remaining work at MDAT, just to give you an overview, uh, Looking at the aerial picture on the left doesn't tell you a whole lot. The rad liquid waste facility that we have is right there. That was the waste treatment facility. From that facility, there was an absorption bed here, and there was an absorption bed on that side. Those are the beds that you see here. The shaft areas are where they actually drilled down, disposed of waste in the shafts, it's a very different configuration than the absorption beds. Beneath MDAT, we do have, because it was rad liquid waste, there is a tritium plume uh, that has manifested around where the absorption beds were centered. Uh, that is part of what we would have to complete the investigation for and then analyze and submit a remedy for. We have done the phase one investigation. We completed that in 2006 before we did the ARA. But as you can see, the ARA project did dominate a three-year period out at the Mesa. And then the priorities afterwards have precluded us from going back. 
We still need to evaluate the information that we did collect in a corrective measures evaluation. And then we would propose what we would expect to be a remedy for the area and submit that to the state. And then the state would have to go forward with public notice of that recommendation and their statement of basis before a remedy would actually be selected finally. So there's quite a while that's necessary for us to prepare our corrective measures and for the state to do their public notice and then to finally make a decision. So this activity won't be done in the real near term, not by any fashion, but we will likely consider what's left to do for us to prepare the corrective measures evaluation report. Uh, DP site aggregate area. We talked about the buried wastelines. That is the primary activity for the DP site aggregate area investigations that we have. Uh, fully half of all the buried lines went from the DP West facilities and still remain to be removed. Uh, the MDAA generals tanks, you can see a conceptual layout in the picture where we've got the central debris pit the two smaller trenches, and you can just tell from the relationship in the picture how small they are compared to what you were briefed at from DA Bravo. And then the general's tanks are on the west side, located over here. The plans that we have, fairly straightforward. We would like to, well, the dates on here are initial projections before we've talked with the state. We have not come to agreement on what the time frames are. Uh, I mentioned the water towers that are coming down almost immediately. They'll be dropped on the ground in September, or excuse me, August. We will spend a few months cutting the material up, and the material will all be eligible to be sent for recycling. There will likely be a 55-gallon drum with associated you know, odds and ends that you can't send to a recycler, but the entire tower structures from the little concrete pads up would constitute recyclable material. Uh, we would hope that we would address demolition of the remaining facilities once we do the water towers. What's the next piece? Probably something along the lines of the warehouse or the sanitary waste treatment facility. They're relatively small. They're isolated from the more contaminated areas where the buried pipe is, so I can do them independently. General's tanks removal, one of the things that we have to go and address is the actual contents of the remaining limited water and sludge. If we can develop plans for that, then we can move forward to trying to figure out what the real schedule is. If we have to remove the sludge, there's quite a complicated process for material removal, primarily because those sludges, because of the plutonium, constitutes possibly a transuranic waste threshold. So you've got a whole different set of standards than what I would normally have for contaminants to, for disposal. So the planning on that, we hope to get started on in 16, and we'd have to go and work out whatever sort of plan we have to go and deal with those tanks. The removal of the buried waste lines would be the next one. In terms of priority order, I think this is what's reflected in terms of what we would propose uh, if the state agrees. After we address the general's tank's contents, we would probably try removing the buried waste lines. Reason is, if we clean up some of the other facilities and put them in a clean condition, the removal of the buried waste lines always has the potential for redistributing some level of contamination. Whether it be above or below the release thresholds, we would hate to go clean one area up and then have it dirtied and then have to go back in and clean this area a second time. So we'll do the dirty work with the buried waste lines, and once it's there, it covers a very wide, broad area. Then the other smaller physical locations can be cleaned much more expediently. The characterization of the MDAA pits and trenches, one of the lessons we learned on MDA Bravo was that we jumped into it probably without enough characterization to control the project. And we ended up having some cost overruns. We had to re-estimate waste quantities, which were the huge driver to what we had. So we're proposing going back in, taking some actual test pits in the top surface of the trenches and the pits to go find out where is the heavy stuff? Did they represent the same sort of disposal philosophies in this landfill that they found observed in MDA Bravo? Because the ends of the trench were the hot spots on Bravo. If we find the ends of the trenches again are hot spots, our plan will be that much better for it. So we want to go in and do those characterization studies. 
Then we have to evaluate the results again and submit a proposed remedy to the state, and we go through the same process of theirs for a statement of basis with public review. After the A, we would end up putting that process in place. We're recommending that then we go and deal with MDAT. MDAT, because of the contents, we had never envisioned trying to transfer that parcel to the county. We realized that the contents of that probably would remain under federal control, either by DOE EM temporarily, by NNSA until the Los Alamos National Laboratory closed, and potentially in the future by the DOE Office of Legacy Management, which handles all of the legacy sites, including Rocky Flats. So we would finish what we have to do, put it in a condition, and then consider what would be necessary for maintaining custody uh, in perpetuity with surveillance and maintenance on a recurring basis. MDAT does have the possibility that after a remedy that might include a cap, if that's the remedy that the state agrees with, there might be possibilities of allowing the county to use the top surface. If you cap it, you could put a parking lot on top. Okay, it might make things easier for the county, but those are things that would have to be discussed with the state before we have a discussion with the county, but at least we'll be considering the potential options that we have. And then the last piece of the plan is when we get done with all of it, we are planning to transfer all pieces of TA-21, with the exception of MDAT right now, to the county for their use. Right now, this is the map for land transfer. You can see the areas that are on the far right are not related to TA-21, but the TA-21 basically tips here and goes around this red area here and you can see the shape of this elbow, that's MDA Bravo. This piece that's on the other side of the road actually reflects DP Canyon, which is on the back side of where the current county businesses are located. There's a little white piece in the middle. That's where the county businesses are. So you can see the proximity of where the county already has businesses located and where the population comes into contact with us, and then the rest of the site that you have. In summary, we hope to do a quick start with the water towers and then continue with some of the demolition activities. Uh, we're going to be integrating the demolition with the remediation. That one is primarily because if I pull the concrete slabs up at DP West, we know that the subsurface soils around those slabs are contaminated with hazardous wastes. If I pull the concrete up, I now expose it. So I have to be ready to dig the soil the moment the concrete is out of the way. So there's this coordination between the demolition and the cleanup that I've got a plan for. We had mentioned earlier there's a question on campaigns. All of this work at TA21 is already in the consent order. The demolition is not explicitly mentioned and it's not covered under the consent order, but we have to do the demolition to get to the contaminated soils and the buried items that are covered under the aggregate area investigation. So the tie is there and you've got to do them both together. We would hope that we would have a concerted activity where once you get started, you finish the whole segment, and then you can walk away. Uh, that was commonly referred to as the campaign concept. We've just pulled the pieces of demolition, the aggregate areas, and then potentially the MDA A and T closures, all as part of what we want to consider. Although I'm going to bet that dealing with the MDAs because of the state's requirement for publishing a draft statement of basis and the time frames necessary, we could finish all the rest of it and then we'll have a period where we have the public discussions. So we'll walk away for a while and then come back later to do A and T. That's just my surmise. But um, I do think that we can probably execute the two MDAs remaining, A and T, within a relatively short period. It's, a, it's straightforward construction if you build a cap. If you're going to excavate, that estimate's off the table, but we'll have to see what the remedy says. And then the last bullet just talks about the integration with the New Mexico Environment Department. We have had very good discussions to date with the Environment Department in terms of what we are proposing. We have already submitted four corrective measures evaluations for other MDAs at the laboratory to the Environment Department, but because of the prioritization for the transuranic waste, the 3706, plus the groundwater, they're not ready 
to go talk about those four that they've already got. So we don't want to go dump a few more things on them anytime soon until they have a chance to work through the process on the ones they've got. So the discussions with the Environment Department will likely carry out for the next couple of years just talking about background issues, and it may not directly address TA-21 except for prioritizing annual work, and that we'll have a regular discussion with them. And that was about it. I'll take any questions if you'd like. Yes. That's, that's part of what we still have to go and work out. If it truly gets categorized as transuranic waste, right now we would only have one disposal location, which would be WIP. It would have to be collected, packaged appropriately, and surveyed out through the processes. And of course, that's contingent upon WIP reopening so that they will accept landal shipments. If it is characterized and it does not come out as transuranic waste, which I'm not real hopeful, uh, there are more options for the potential sludge disposal that we could do. Uh, if it is categorized as low-level waste, which is unlikely, uh, we've got three or four potential disposal locations. One could be on site at TA-54. We could ship it to the, I can never remember the acronym, NNSS, which is the Nevada test site, what used to be referred to there. And I believe that we also have possibility of shipping to Clive, if I'm not mistaken. But it would depend on what those sample characterizations are, and right now I don't have that available. So we've got a couple of options, but it depends on the characterization that comes back. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have two questions. One is, can you tell me um, about the process for remediating soils? And my other question um, is, as far as the work that's to be done, is it going to be um, utilizing existing staff, or are there going to be workers solicited to complete this? work? I'll try and answer both. Um, right now we are not using technologies to treat soils for contaminants. What our plan currently do is is to excavate the contaminated soil until the soil, uh, the soil that is left meets the soil screening levels. The soil that is removed would be packaged up. What we've done is use the um, bins, I think they call them IP1 or IP2 bins depending on what waste is going into it. They're the bins that you see on the back of trash trucks and things like that, but ours are covered, they're sealed, um, and then they're shipped to a lined disposal facility that is permitted to dispose of that type of waste. And there are a couple of them, Clive, Utah might being one, but it depends on what the soil contamination actually shows. Like I say, until we start getting these buried waste lines up and get the slabs up, I may have to take some measures to drill through the slabs to find out what those soils actually look like, and that's what we're going to have to put a plan together for next year for the following year to give us the data back. Uh, the, sorry, the second question you had was? It had to do with the, the, work, the workforce for this project. Right now, we would expect some combination of lands performing work, which is our m and contractor. There are some things out there, for example, we've put them back to work to go and do general site cleanup from the remaining items from the ARA projects. There are bits and pieces out there to do. Uh, their contracting alternatives include master task order agreements, and they would task to various contractors or subcontractors. And there may be opportunity for some of the work, although right now the plans are relatively small amounts, uh, possibly the warehouse. We might tear down the warehouse as another federalized project. That plan has not been fixed yet. So we've got various op options that is not just land staff. Likely most of the work, I'm going to surmise, most of it will be contractors. You're welcome. Bob. One of the last experiments that we did at DA21, mm -hmm. I was involved with that. Huh. And they asked me to look at some things that were very, very radioactive with mm -hmm. plutonium-239, tritium, uranium, and other another thing and I said I would do them mm -hmm. provided they would provide me enough 
glove boxes. And they said, here's some glove boxes. Crap them up as much as you want. We don't care. So I did. <laughs> so I was wondering how you cleaned all that mess up. Um, I was not personally involved with the R projects. I was aware of what was going on. The buildings that were at DP West were the ones for the plutonium experiments. Those glove boxes were inside those facilities. There were similar glove boxes that were in the TSTA uh, facility, for example, for the tritium experiments. All of that equipment was either removed prior to the demolition and then most likely cut up and disposed of as part of the waste stream uh, prior to actually cutting the, tearing the buildings down and then dealing with its waste stream. There were some activities beforehand to go and remove that equipment. It's been quite a while. I think most of the stuff you're talking about for glove boxes was removed before 2009. I couldn't tell you the exact dates. Jeff, did you have more information? Just one thing on that. The, uh, we were doing the 3706 project, some of the glove boxes that had been packaged up that came from TA21 were part of the inventory, Bob, that we dispositioned on that project. Yeah, I'm not sure they've all been shipped off site, but I think that's your plutonium experiment glove boxes right there. <laughs> I didn't personally see your name on any. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a reminder, if we can press the button when we speak. So, Bob, there was one glove box the uh, folks at TA-54 dubbed the Mother of Satan, and I believe that was probably <laughs> your box. <laughs> David, Doug, uh, yes, do you envision having to do a environmental impact statement on this or a number of imp environmental impact statements on what you're going to do, or none at all? <laughs> we have the site-wide environmental impact statement, which was issued. Rod 3 had talked about um, the decision to go and continue with the environmental remediation under the consent order work. Uh, it does have Appendix I, which includes the descriptive nature of all of the work we're doing. There are some site-specific things that we are doing supplement analyses for to determine whether they were fully encompassed by that site-wide environmental impact statement. Right now, we do not envision have to do another EIS for the environmental remediation, but we probably will have to do a series of project-specific supplement analyses primarily to support the remedies that are eventually chosen, just to make sure that they were covered. Would this require any public hearings to be done? It shouldn't. The typical process for a supplement analysis, if the determination is that it was appropriately analyzed in the SWICE, then we don't have any public notice. Uh, so if the supplement analysis leads to that conclusion that it was covered, there would be a categorical exclusion that goes and says, it's been done, don't worry about it. If the supplement analysis comes back and says the analysis under the SWICE was not sufficient, that's a whole other story. We may have to do uh, a different type of analysis to analyze it in more detail to then figure out whether it was covered or go back and do an EIS. That part we have not made a decision on. The first example of the environmental impact is not related to 21, but we are currently uh, getting a contractor in to do a supplement analysis for the chromium investigation because where those plans may lead does constitute a potential impact on groundwater. So was that sufficiently described or was it not? Ellison. Yeah. I have uh, three unrelated questions. The first is uh, MDAV, as in Victor. You said that um, there was some in situ vitrification that yes. went on there. Yes. How big is the monolith of glass underground? I should have known you'd ask the question. Um, I don't have a real good feel for that now. I do know that it was not 
It was much larger than the size of a car. But the sources that we were taking a look at vitrifying were not that much larger. They were a couple of relatively small absorption beds off a rad laundry facility. Um, so it didn't require anywhere near the size of absorption beds that were found at MDAT. So they're relatively small in comparison. And how far beneath the surface? If I'm not mistaken, they were glassifying somewhere probably not a lot more than 15, 18 feet and probably up to about six feet below the surface. Mm -hmm. It was not a surface vitrification. It was buried soils. A little bit about MDAB being over budget because not enough characterization was mm -hmm. done and the plan to do more characterization at MDAA. Right. What, did, what does that characterization look like? Is that looking at data records more closely or, or searching around file cabinets or is that digging in the ground oh, no. and pulling Th up samples? This is actually more? digging in the ground. When they did MDA Bravo, they did a couple things called push tests. They probed and drove in a hollow stake type things to see what came up. There was a limited amount done. You've got to cover a pretty wide area. One of the things they did not do is they did not happen to catch the increase in material that was at the last part of the excavated trench. So we need to do more push tests to generally characterize and then we need to dig down through the topsoils to actually expose some of the buried wastes so that we can actually see what type of content it is. Was it containerized? Was it non? Was it bags? Was it poured liquid? Is it um, fill that had been wetted by chemicals? Uh, what sort of thing? So we're actually going to drill down or remove some of the top cover, actually take some physical samples of the material, send it off to the lab to figure out how bad it is, and then cover those test pits back up. That's what we're proposing. And when that work occurs, I remember MDAB, there were big tents covering up the area. Do I understand that would occur at MDAA also? Uh, for doing the sampling, it would likely not be tented. The advantage for MDAA, it is quite a distance from where the public businesses are. MDA Bravo was right across the road. We didn't want to take the chance. That's why we did the excavation in enclosures. There are still two movable enclosures out at TA-21 that we could use for the work at MDAA if we chose to. Um, we do not necessarily expect that what we find will require the enclosures. That's part of what we have to put together from the sample plan. And then my last question, if you can pull up that map slide that shows the red and blue, what's been conveyed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right by where it says A10, I think there's a white spot there. I think that's the Verde Ridge Arroyo neighborhood. That's a residential condo complex right in there. This one right yeah, there? Yeah, I think it's, or it's Actually, somewhere near there, right? I believe that one is on the other side of the main road by the airport. Uh, yeah, Th that's this the channel. This channel right here is the DP Canyon that runs behind the businesses, such as the lumber, the lumber um, store, the newspaper, the art right. store, right. the fire station. I don't remember there being but, anything there. But right above, if you look at A10, the zero on the 10, the upper right of that zero, that little square, that's it. Okay. And I'm wondering about the. Um, the soil that's going to be excavated and packed up and shipped away, I doubt that's going to occur under a tent. Is there any risk, or can you tell how that risk is mitigated, of contamination in the air just from the dust being disturbed, even though it's a good distance from the end of DP Road there? Truthfully, that canyon area is not uh, the DP Canyon is actually below grade. They've got some trails that run through there. They have all been surface surveyed. It's not a risk because of it does meet recreational standards. It's intermittent use by people walking through. We are not planning on excavating that soil. That canyon bottom that runs the entire length all the way down past the trail that goes past the other side of the mm -hmm. airport all the way to the end of the TA-21, that trail system bottom, the high water mark for where storm flow goes, is considered an area of concern. We are taking measures to go and fully evaluate that 
prior to the transfer of the parcel to the county, but we do not envision specific action to remove those soils, which is the nearest part to the residential area. But for the soils on the top of the mesa, the requirements for us to do any disturbing work with dust suppression there, we would be doing it under damp environments, not wet, obviously, but we would be doing that under damp conditions so that there was no dust blown. When we do this work, we will do the same sort of controls for air monitoring. Right along the edge of MDA Bravo, for example, we had seven air monitors that we used to determine whether anything was leaving the area. We would have the same sort of system when we start cleaning up 21. Now, that doesn't currently exist there. There are only a few along that edge, but we would put in what was necessary to monitor that for you. I'm glad to hear that. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Steve. Yes. Uh, you may have mentioned this, but I didn't hear it. Uh, have you is there any evidence of groundwater contamination under this site? Or have no. you looked for it? We have monitoring wells surrounding the area. Matter of fact, one of the activities that we are going to be doing probably in the next two years is to change the sampling systems in there because currently we have what's called West Bay. They're non-purgeable systems, but they still show representative data. It's just what's flowed through the monitoring hole. Uh, we're going to go to purgeable systems, but right now the only thing that we have is a relatively shallow vapor plume along MDAT uh, that I mentioned, the tritium plume. Uh, it is in the roughly the top 200 feet, and groundwater is at least another 600 feet below that. So we have had no contaminants that have shown anywhere in the groundwater. Okay. Thank you, David. You're welcome. About the outfalls? Yes, sir. What type of outfalls were they, and did you just plug the outfalls, or did you investigate down below where, where the discharge was? No, we actually have the uh, schmooze that were listed below the outfalls had been rem uh, remediated. The outfall itself were almost universally pipe outlets, and it went to, in some cases, a like a culvert box, and then the water flowed out from the culvert box. The pipe, the culvert box, and the soils below that, uh, the, the pipe and the culvert box were removed, and the soils were characterized, and if they needed removal because they were above screening levels, they were removed. Uh, as a matter of fact, in DP Canyon below that, we actually have some backup stormwater controls, uh, some berms, so that any continued potential stormwater runoff would make sure it stayed in that canyon bottom and not migrate downstream. We typically remove the soils that are above the screening level. We may excavate to some level below the screening levels, depending upon the risk analysis. Um, but I can say that what is exposed on the surface right now is all below screening levels. So there isn't anything that's above the level that's accessible to the human environment right now. And can you tell us what your screening levels are based on? What's the foundation of your screening uh, levels? Screening levels are the NMED screening levels. It comes out of their regulations. Soil screening levels? Yes, that's correct. Any more questions for Mr. Rhodes? Again, thank you, David. You're Appreciate welcome. Appreciate you coming. And I'm sure we'll be back talking about other things for you.